All right, well, good morning once again. It's good to see everybody. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5? Galatians 5. Now, if you're new with us, welcome. It's good to see you this morning. And just to let you know, we are working our way through the book of Galatians here at Calvary on Sunday mornings, uh, going through the book topically based on its main theme. The main theme of Galatians is liberty, uh, the liberty or the freedom that is ours in Christ. We're in a section that is uh, we're calling Liberty for Life. And this morning we're going to be in chapter 5 looking at verses 16 to 18, which starts out with the words, I say then, I say then. Now, when Paul said at the beginning of verse 16, I say then, it tells us that what he's going to give, uh, that at this point, he's going to make an application or give an exhortation based on what he's just gotten done saying. So whenever you see, therefore, or I say then, uh, the writer is going to make now an application, in this case, give an exhortation, based on what he's already said. So back up to verse 1. Now let's kind of see where Paul's, uh, what he's talking about. Where he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Verse 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, guys, actually, the passage runs from verse 16 through verse 25. And it's built around four key thoughts or ideas. Uh, and I'll just mention each one based on a single a statement. So we have the command in verse 16, the conflict, verses 17 and 18, the contrast in verses 19 to 23, and then the conquest, verses 24 and 25. And in this section, Paul is, outla is uh, outlining for us how victory is achieved in the Christian life. Victory over the flesh. Now, let me just say this. Of course, all victory in the Christian life starts with the um, acknowledging that we are under the authority of Jesus Christ, our commanding officer, the one that we should want to obey and please as good soldiers of Christ. You remember what Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, look, Timothy, uh, you know, you must endure suffering. And endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Soldiers don't get tied up or entangled with the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them as a soldier. And so Jesus Christ is laying this out through the Holy Spirit, speaking through the Apostle Paul. But the first thing we want to look at is the command in verse 16. Again, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The word walk is the Greek word peripatao, and uh, it's in the present imperative, which means present is an ongoing thing, uh, imperative is a command. So what Paul is saying is he's commanding us to keep on walking in the Spirit. It's not, you know, if you feel like it one day, walk in the Spirit for a while, or this or that. It's like, this is the command from Jesus Christ himself to his people. You need to walk every day consistently in the Spirit. It's a command. What does it mean, though, to walk in the Spirit? We throw these phrases around, but exactly what does it mean? Well, three things primarily. First, it means that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that you're saved. You can't walk in the Spirit if the Spirit is not in you. And that happens at the moment of salvation. We'll talk about that more in a, a moment. So first of all, it means the Holy Spirit is in you. Uh, you're saved. Secondly, it means to be surrendered and obedient to what the Spirit has revealed in His Word as to the will of God for your life. 
Look, a lot of times people come up to me and say, look, I, I, I just really want to know God's will for my life. And so I don't know God's will for your life individually. You've got to pray about that. But I do know what God has said about all of our lives as his will collectively. That's found in his word. So before you start, and, and it's ridiculous to think, if you're not serious about what God has already said in the Bible, which is his will for your life, why would you think you want to add something else that's not in the Bible? Let's concern ourselves with the basics. What, what his word says is his will for our lives in general is the body of Christ. And then move on from there, right? And a good place to start would be 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 8. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Well, he's expressed it pretty clearly in that passage, but obviously many other places. We'll just get you started with that one. And number three, it means, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Number three, it means to be open and sensitive to the influence and leading of the Holy Spirit in your daily walk. So here we go. This is where most people live when they talk about knowing God's will. They want to know God's individual specific will for my life. I get that. I get that. And for that to take place, you've got to be walking with the Lord. You've got to be in fellowship. You've got to be in the Word, knowing what He has said and praying about keeping all that He has commanded you from His Word. And then you need to be open and sensitive as you're going through your day. Be open and sensitive to the leading, to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he leads all, through all kinds of circumstances and different things. But be open and sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading in your daily walk as God's unwill, His will unfolds in your life from day to day. Now, guys, when a Christian obeys the command to walk in the Spirit, Paul promises under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that you will not, interesting in the Greek, it's a, the emphasis, it's a emphatic double negative. What does that mean? If you walk, if you walk in the Spirit, you absolutely, will, you absolutely will not, no way, is the idea, gratify or fulfill the desires of your fallen nature. Jewish Christian and scholar Arnold Frankenbaum adds this very important point. He said, furthermore, the Greek word for walk means to accomplish one's daily tasks. Now he goes on to say, of course, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But Frankenbaum says, look, when you talk about walking in the Spirit, part of that means to accomplish your daily tasks for the Lord. What does that mean? Well, we need to give our walk with God the priority it deserves. Let's be honest, all right? A lot of us, we're not putting the kind of effort into our walk with the Lord that we really should. And I'm, and I'm guilty too. Uh, it, it's just something we need to think about. That, you know, we need to give our walk with God the priority it deserves by giving preference to our daily devotional responsibilities. That's what Frankenbaum is saying. That's what I believe Paul is telling us. That, look, you know, let's get serious about our daily prayer time, Bible study, reading, uh, fellowshipping with us, coming to church, and so on. We need to give these things a priority, not make them the, the afterthought of the day. If I have any time left, maybe I'll pray a little, few minutes or read a couple verses or whatever it might be. That's not having a serious walk with God, and you're not going to walk in the Spirit with that kind of a, kind of a shallow approach to your devotional life. Now, listen. The legalist, and Paul's coming against legalism, all right? Legalism takes many forms. In Paul's case, it was those that were adhering to Judaism with all of its rituals. And, and of course, the big one that came up was circumcision, how that uh, many believed that you can't be saved unless you're first circumcised. But you could plug in any religion. You can plug in any religion that has rituals and ceremonies that teach people they have to keep. As a Catholic, it was baptism. You had to be water baptized. Some churches outside of the Catholic Church believe that salvation, uh, baptism is essential for salvation. I don't believe that. It's a ritual. Rituals don't save us. All right, we, we do rituals after we're saved. After you receive Christ, then we baptize you as a symbol of what's taking place spiritually. All right, But baptism doesn't save. But the uh, legalist has a form of, I don't know, spiritual, uh, spiritual dyslexia when they read Galatians 5.16. They, they read it this way. Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, and you shall walk in the Spirit. But that's not what Paul's saying, is it? Look, the legalist is always trying to do battle against the flesh by using the strength of 
the flesh. That's a religion. That's what religion is. It's man's efforts to please God through keeping laws and commandments and rituals and ceremonies, etc. Um, but again, you'll never, ever defeat the flesh by using the flesh. Hard work, raw determination, not going to cut it. New Year's resolutions, forget them. They don't work. What is Paul saying? Basically saying, feed the Spirit. Feed the Spirit. I'm sorry. Don't fight the flesh. Feed the Spirit. I get a little dyslexia there myself. I I reversed that. See that? God humbled me. Don't fight the flesh. Feed the Spirit. You want to know how to walk with the Lord in victory? Focus on your relationship with Jesus. And then when that is strong, he'll live his life through you. You don't need to fight the flesh directly. He paid the price. He conquered uh, principalities and powers on Calvary's cross, rose the third day from the dead to conquer death. He did all the work. Draw close to him. The life that I now live, uh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's all about Jesus living his life through us, right? Abiding in him so he can live his life through us. But listen, Paul again, verse 16 said, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. One pastor says, simply put, if we walk in the Spirit, instead of trying to live by the law, we naturally shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, the word translated flesh in verse 16 can mean the physical body. It's used that way quite a bit in the New Testament. I'll give you a couple of examples. Right around Christmas time, we hear a lot of the a verse from John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation, right? We're getting ready to celebrate Christmas, which celebrates the incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God, who was spirit, entered into the human race, became a man. He took on a body of flesh, right? After he rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them in Luke 24, verse 39, Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see I have. Their flesh, of course, speaking of his physical body. So the word translated flesh in verse 16 can mean physical body, but the vast majority of the time that word is used in the New Testament, it's speaking of our fallen nature, of our fallen nature, the nature we were born with that part of us that we inherited from Adam when we entered into the human race. But then, of course, when a person surrenders their life to Jesus, they're born again. They're born again. Or some translations translate that, born from above, John 3, verse 3. Guys, this is a spiritual birth. We know this. A spiritual birth that connects us to God and enables us now to have fellowship or communion with Him. That was not possible before we were born of the Spirit because we commune with God. We have a relationship with God spirit to spirit. His Holy Spirit uh, connecting with our spirit, which was dead until we received Christ. That would, that's why God born again. Adam killed it in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago when he disobeyed God. But that's what gets born again. When you receive Christ, you receive your spirit is resurrected and you're now connected to God on a spiritual level. But when we connect with God on this level, when we accept Christ, Jesus told us the Spirit of God moves in. He moves in, and he gives to us God's divine nature. That's 2 uh, Peter 1, verse 4. We become partakers of God's divine nature. And in part, that means that we now have his heart, his love, his character, his desires, and so on. Now listen, our flesh, though, which means our old nature, doesn't go away, does it? We wish it would. When we accept Christ, we wish the old nature would uh, go away. It doesn't. It hangs hangs in like an unwanted house guest that's overstayed his welcome. You can't get rid of him. It's, uh, you know, Cousin Harry. uh, who wanted to come over for, you know, just to spend the holidays, Christmas uh, and New Year's. But he came New Year's and stayed till Christmas, that kind of thing, right? (laughs) But... uh, The old nature doesn't go away. It stays with us. And it still tries to control our thoughts, our minds, our physical bodies, what we do, where we go, and so on. It still wants to be our master. 
It doesn't have legal right anymore. Jesus, we, Jesus owns us. But because it is part of us, uh, it doesn't go away. It stays until we are raptured and we finally jettison the old nature and we only have now a glorified body with a brand new nature, right? But it still wants to hang in there. It still wants to try to uh, control our uh, minds and our bodies instead of getting, allowing us to, you know, um, obey the will of the Holy Spirit who lives in us now. And guys, that's where the war comes in. That's where the war comes in, right? The flesh and the spirit are fighting with one another for dominance now that you're a Christian. This is where the struggles come inside, you know, and um, the conflict. And that brings us to the second point we want to look at, the conflict, verses 17 and 18, right? First one was the command, all right? Second is the conflict. For the flesh lusts or wars against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, guys, let me say this. Many Christians, especially younger Christians, over the years have come to me, and because of all the struggles they have going on, they feel that that's an indication that they're not saved. Because if I was really a Christian, why would I still be struggling with all these things? I must not be saved. And I try to encourage them and say, look, this is a proof that you are saved. That you are Just the opposite is true. The devil's trying to get you to think because you're struggling with things, that you're not saved. But just the opposite is true, because before you received Christ, you didn't have two natures. We only had one nature, the fallen nature, and it controlled everything we did. We didn't fight against it. We may have uh, paused before we did something because our conscience was bothering us, but we did it anyways. And now that we've received Christ, the Spirit of God has moved in, and now there's this war there's this internal struggle that's taking place that you and I never had before we received Christ. I think the words of Martin Luther at this point would be helpful. He said, dead men don't struggle. If you're dead in trespasses and sins, which was all of our, the case with all of us before we got saved, we didn't struggle with the flesh or sin. We did it. Whatever gratified us, satisfied our, us, we did. But now that we're ch children of God, uh, our spirit has been born again, and there is this war going on. And that's what we're talking about. Now, let me just say this. God has promised us victory, though, over our fallen sin nature. God has promised us victory. But it's a conditional promise. Notice it. Walk in the Spirit, then you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Guys, a conditional promise means that we must do something. We have something to do. We have a part. And if we're faithful in doing our part, God will be faithful in keeping his part, fulfilling the promise that he's given to us. All right? That's the nature of a conditional promise. And the Bible contains many conditional promises. Just a, a, one that came to my mind. Um, there's so many of them, but I just thought I'd read to you Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Since you know this one, I'll read it to the NLT. Philippians 4, verse 6. Where Paul said, don't worry about anything. Instead, Christmas time, this is a good one for Christmas time. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Now, that's our part. Then, God's part, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. If you're not going to pray, if you're not going to bring it to God, you have not because you what? Ask not. If you're not going to pray in faith, God loves you and he's going to take care of you, then there's going to be no peace. But if you pray in faith, then the peace of God which passes human understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Guys, remember the best way to... Uh, we, this is a war against the darkness, okay? So... We now are children of light. God is light, of course. In him is no darkness at all. So we are not his kids. We are children of light, right? And we are at war with darkness. Light in the Bible metaphorically could mean truth, uh, holiness, uh, obedience, righteousness, that kind of thing. Darkness, that's lies, rebellion, uh, all kinds of the stuff that Satan controls, okay? 
We're talking about having victory really over darkness. The darkness has gotten control, Satan, of our fallen nature and wants to use it against us to keep us away from God, right? But what happens? You want to fight the darkness, right? Let's just look at this from just, a, just for a second from a, a physical level. You walk into a dark room, right? Pitch black. You want to dispel the darkness. You want the light to come on. What do you do? Do you take a karate stance and start chopping the darkness? Do you fight against the darkness? No, you just flip on the light, right? You flip the switch, the light comes on, darkness is gone. The same is true in our spiritual life. You want to dispel darkness in your life, any areas of compromise, sin, whatever? Don't fight the darkness. Turn on the light. What, what does that mean? Turn to 1 John chapter 1. And I'm just going to start with verse 5. 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is perfect. In him there is absolutely no moral imperfection, uh, no sin of any kind, and so on. He's absolutely perfect and pure. He is light. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first principle with regard to turning on the light, walking in the light, which will be give you victory over whatever darkness you're fighting with regard to bad habits or or whatever it might be get your life right with god now if your life is not right with god in some way and you know it I'm not, you know i'm not saying you're the worst sinner in the body of christ or anything it, you don't need to be if you're if you're involved in sin and you know it's sin you know it's wrong but you're still doing it your fellowship with the god is broken you're never going to have victory if your fellowship with god is broken because the strength comes from him so what you got to do is, the first step is confess your sins. Acknowledge that, Lord, I've been doing something wrong. In fact, the Greek word for confess means to say the same thing. I'm not making excuses. I'm not blaming anybody else. I'm only taking ownership of whatever thing I'm doing wrong. And I'm saying to God, Lord, you said this was wrong, and I'm saying the same thing too. It's wrong. I know it's wrong. Forgive me, Lord. I want to, I want to be cleansed of this. I don't want to do this anymore. And God says, that's what I wanted to hear. And then he cleanses us, from, forgives us, cleanses us. That's the first step to walking in the light, right? Which is walking in the Spirit. So that's important. But let me just say this. As a pastor especially, I understand, not, not only because of my own struggles, but I understand from all the people that have come to me over the years, the frustration, the frustration that comes from constant warfare with our fallen nature on a daily basis. And some people get so uh, demoralized by it. They want to give up. Uh, I remember my pastor saying years ago that he had a young guy in his church, came up to him uh, one Sunday after church, and said, Chuck, he said, I've been wrestling with homosexuality my whole life. And, and now that I'm a Christian, I thought I'd have complete victory. It wouldn't be a problem anymore, but I'm still struggling, Chuck. In fact, it's, so, it, it's, it's just worn me out. And, and I'm just, I can't fight it anymore. I'm just going to give in to it. And Chuck said, listen to me, you never, ever give in to your flesh. You never make a treaty with it. You never surrender to it. God has promised you, you're going to have victory. You hang in there. You keep walking. You keep praying. You keep seeking God. The strength will come. You will have victory. It'll come slowly, perhaps, but you'll have it. Just like God said to Israel before they entered the promised land. He said, look, when you enter the promised land, I'm not going to drive the enemy out from before you in one year. Okay, but little by little until you are strong enough to possess the whole land. But then he went on to say, but you know what? He said, warfare is good for you. Warfare keeps you on your knees. If I was to give victory to you all at one time, you'd become lazy. You'd become, you know, um, impotent in your walk with me. Uh, you wouldn't depend on me for anything. 
Daily warfare has a way of honing us, strengthening us, right? Drawing us close to God. It, it's a way of saying, Lord, I'm weak and I need your strength. And what did Paul say about when I'm weak, then I'm what? Strong. God does not want to build our self-reliance. He wants, doesn't want us to be independent. He wants us dependent on him. That's why he doesn't just flood all the answered prayers in at the same time. It's little by little as we walk with him, because that's the thing. He wants us to walk with him. He loves us, and he wants us to draw close to him every day. Now, let me just say this. When we get saved, here's the problem. We get saved. Now we have a new spirit and a redeemed soul living in an unredeemed body. Okay? That's the problem. All right? I've got this new spirit and this redeemed soul living in an unredeemed body. And that leads to a lot of frustration, which is why Paul said in Romans 8, 23, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That's what we're waiting for now. When the rapture happens, we're going to get glorified bodies. See, the problem is that we, we have new life in an old container. Someday we're going to get a new container, a glorified body. At the time of the rapture, right? I'm waiting for that, all right? But John the Apostle put it this way. He said, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed at the rapture, Jesus Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to get our glorified bodies. And then we're not going to struggle with the flesh. We're not going to, there's going to be no more tears or sorrow or pain or grief. Or death, of course. John says, And everyone who has this hope, the hope of eternal life in him, purifies himself even as Jesus Christ is pure. That hope that Jesus could come at any second, any moment, rapture me off this earth. When he comes, I want to see, I want him to find me doing, not living in sin. So that hope of his coming purifies us. It, it, it spurs on a holy life is the idea. So, guys, we're commanded to, to keep fighting the good fight of faith. And a big part of that is going to be against our fallen nature. That, that's the, you know, we think about all the unbelievers that we have to fight and all the you know, people that are against Christianity. They're our enemies. Let me just tell you something. You know my, who my biggest enemy is? The guy I shave in the morning. That's my biggest enemy. D.L. Moody put it this way. He said, I have more trouble with D.L. Moody than with any man I know. <laughs> Amen to that. We are our big... I don't know. So it was like, I saw a cartoon years ago. I don't even know what cartoon it was or uh, who wrote this thing, but uh, maybe you've heard it. We have met the enemy, and he is us. And the sooner you meet the enemy, the true enemy, and realize it's me the better off you're going to be in your walk with the Lord because you're not going to be putting more reliance on yourself, thinking how good we are, you know? No. We see ourselves for what we are, and we are weak. We are, you know, sinners saved by grace, and we need God's grace and strength every single day to live for Him and walk with Him and please Him, right? But look at verse 18, Galatians 5. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What exactly does that mean? Well, I, here's what I think Paul is saying. Only those controlled by their fallen natures, that would be unbelievers, only those controlled by their fallen natures need laws to restrain their evil desires and actions. What am I saying? Well, I'm saying what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He said, Timothy, we know the law is good, but only if one uses it lawfully. The law was never intended to save us, but the law was given to unbelievers to show us our sin to drive us to Christ. And that's why Paul said the law is good if you use it lawfully, properly, knowing this, that the law was not made for a righteous person. God never gave the law to, to Christians or to righteous people. It was always for unrighteous sinners. 
to show them their sin, to drive them to Jesus away from religion, to come to Jesus for salvation by grace. For the lawless, it was made not for a righteous person, the law, but was made for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly, for, the, for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and, and any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's, the law was made for unbelievers, right? Once we receive Christ, the Spirit of God moves in. Right, God writes His laws in my heart. I don't want to, I don't, you don't need to tell me Thou shalt not steal, and if you do, you're going to get six months in jail or something. I'm not going to steal from anybody. Jesus lives in my heart. I don't want to steal, hurt anybody, and so on. We know that. the law, God's laws, His heart is given to us. We don't need external laws written on tablets of stone like Israel had, uh, bearing consequences to force us to do the right thing. But if a person is not going to accept Christ as their Savior, you're going to need external laws. One of our forefathers, I forgot who it was, said, either men are going to be controlled by the Bible or by the bayonet. It's one or the other. We want to see people control their lives through the Bible, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But if not, and there are people who are pushing for a lawless society, anarchy, because all laws are evil, oh yeah. Try to live in a society where there's total anarchy. It's the jungle law, the, the survival of the fittest, Right? Uh, the might is right kind of a thing. That's a different sermon. But you understand, right? Now look, we're still looking at the second main idea in this section, conflict, all right? But I want to kind of tiptoe over to verse 19 just to grab a couple of thoughts. We'll come back to that next week as we get into the third section, the contrast. But anyways, we're still looking at the conflict or warfare that we're going to have against our flesh in the Christian life. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. It goes on. Let me stop there, though. Notice how Paul transitions from the lust of the flesh in verse 16 to the works of the flesh in verse 19. How does that work in our lives? How do we go from the lust of the flesh, which are internal attitudes, sins of the heart, and all of a sudden start doing outward actions, uh, the sins of, the, uh, of, uh, of our outward actions, right? Uh, kind of a thing, outward sin. Well, let me just put it this way. God has given the human body. Now, our bodies were created by God. He's given the human body legitimate drives for the survival of man and the perpetuation of the human race. God has given us these drives built into our physical bodies for our own survival and the perpetuation of the human race. I'll list you some of them in the order of intensity from the strongest down to the weaker ones. First of all, top of the list, air drive, followed by the water drive, the food drive, the sleep drive, the sex drive, and so on. And when, and when these drives are kept under the control of the Spirit, they are normal, legitimate, and beneficial. They are God-given drives. They are what we might call the needs of the flesh. The needs of the flesh, our physical body. However, when these physical drives are allowed to be controlled by man's fallen sinful nature, they become perverted and destructive. What the Bible calls the lust of the flesh. When that happens, thirst becomes drunkenness, hunger becomes gluttony, sleep becomes laziness, and sex becomes immorality. And when these lusts are given into and acted upon, they become the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. But I want you to know something. Paul calls these, calls these outward sins the works of the flesh. He doesn't tell, call them the demon of drunkenness. The demons of drunkenness and gluttony and lust and immorality, that must be cast out. The person's going to be free of these things. That's how deliverance ministries got their start, by misinterpreting what the Bible's teaching. Folks, and I just tell you this, you can't exercise or cast out the flesh from you. The flesh is going to be with us until we receive our glorified body. And then we'll have a new body 
which will have no fall and sin nature. But right now, to cast out the demon of chocolate cake or nicotine, if that's going to solve the problem, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. And let me just say this. The flesh, and I'm talking about not the physical body, but our fallen nature. The flesh can't be reasoned or negotiated with. It can't be rehabilitated or reformed. That's religion. That's what religion attempts to do. The Bible says it can't be done. In me that is in my flesh, Paul said, there dwells what? No good thing. There's nothing salvageable. There's nothing we can work with. And maybe, you know, we work with it long enough. We get a little something good going. God's only command for the flesh is to crucify. Crucify every single day by the power of the Spirit through faith. Crucify it. You want to walk in the Spirit, you got to crucify the flesh by denying it. Every day in the power of God. Deny the flesh. Don't give in to it. Don't make a treaty with it. And the reason be, being is because, guys, the flesh is never satisfied. The flesh is never satisfied. No matter how much you give it, it still wants more. It still wants more. It's like the writer uh, to the Proverbs said in verse, uh, chapter 30, verses 15 and 16. He said, there are three things that are never satisfied. Four never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire never says enough. We could add a fifth thing to that list uh, that is never satisfied, and that's the flesh. The flesh is never satisfied. But Jesus mentions one way of keeping the flesh in check so that we might walk in the Spirit. You all know it. The night before he went to the cross on top of the Mount of Olives as he was giving his, his guys one last discourse, right? He says in Matthew 26, 41, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now there he's talking about flesh in the sense of your physical body. But it's interesting because the context, he's using both definitions in a sense. Yeah, the, the, the focus is the physical. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Your physical man. But the physical man, your flesh, is, seek, is being controlled, or at least tried to control it, being controlled by our fallen sin nature. And so they're both kind of in view, although primarily, obviously, it's the physical body that your flesh, your fallen nature, seeks to control using what? Temptation. Using temptation. And that's why we read Jesus saying, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Watch out for temptation, guys. We know Satan's going to bring it our way at some point in the day, maybe several points. So what we need to do is expect it, be on guard against it, and most importantly, purpose in our hearts before it comes how we're going to handle it. I always think of Joseph in the book of Genesis, right? He was a, a Hebrew slave working for one of Pharaoh's uh, top guys who was always going on the affairs of state for Pharaoh. So he made Joseph, because everything Joseph touched prospered. He just had that gift uh, of God upon him. And so Potiphar made him his steward, his house manager. When he was away out of town on business, Joseph, of course, uh, not just when Potiphar was away, but all the time, he made sure that there were supplies ordered and there for the other slaves and uh, work assignments given, and he just ran the household. But because Pharaoh was gone, excuse me, uh, Potiphar was gone so much, and Joseph was a younger-looking guy, Potiphar's wife was always coming on to Joseph, always coming on and flirting with him and so on. And I'm sure Joseph thought to himself, if the day ever comes when she tries to escalate this, I'm out of here. I'm taking off. He just planned his escape before it ever became a reality. And sure enough, one day she, in the house alone with him, Potiphar's gone. She grabs him by the coat and says, you're going to lay with me right now. He wiggles out of his jacket and runs, right? I believe, guys, that the time when you need to... Um, Prepare yourself for temptation if it comes. Is before it comes. Is before it ever comes. 
Boy, what do you do if that good-looking young guy or gal comes on to you at work and they're hinting about maybe getting together and you know that they got ideas? You can either be flattered by that or you could see it as the greatest threat to everything you love in this world, your marriage, your ministry, the respect of your, of your children, and so on. And if that's where you're coming from, and I hope you are, then you're going to plan how you're going to handle it if it ever comes. And I think just getting out of there as fast as you can is a good way to do that, just like Joseph. And don't make yourself an easy target. You know, I was telling first service, you know, don't make yourself an easy target. Temptation's going to come. The devil's going to bring it. But don't make yourself an easy target by going to places where temptation can easily overcome you. That's why I don't go to all-you-can-eat buffets. <laughs> the sin is built right into the name, all-you-can-eat. I know I'm going to, and I can eat a, I can eat a lot. Uh, you know, I, I stay away from those places. But you know, what if you work with a bunch of guys, and after when you're, you've been as a young Christian, you were wrestling with alcohol, and you've prayed and sought the Lord, and you've been dry now for a, a few months, and you've gotten victory, right? And the guys invite you out to come to, to just to get a beer after work one day. And you tell them, well, I can't. I'm a Christian. I can't do that. Well, come on, come on. Just have, a so just have a soft drink then. Just sit with us. Well, okay. I don't want to be unfriendly. I want to witness to these guys. So you go to the bar. You're sitting there having their beer. You're having your soft drink. And you know how that goes. Oh, come on. You can have one beer. Come on, just one. And you start thinking, well, maybe I can have one. you know. And then pretty soon you're back to drinking again. Don't go to places where you know you're going to be overly tempted because that's an area you have a problem with. So again, the time to be on guard against temptation is before it comes. Before it comes. So if you wait till it comes upon you to try to resist it, you probably won't find the strength to do that. And remember, to feed on the Word of God, which will strengthen you against sin. Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word, O Lord, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Fill your mind with God's word. If you fill your mind with God's word, the devil can't get in there with bad thoughts. But the word of God in other places commands us to be watching and praying, right? After Paul listed all the armor of a Christian, he goes on to add, he says in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful. Hold on to that. To this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. It's not just the defensive weapon of the, uh, of the armor. It's also the offensive weapon of praying, right? Praying. Peter mentions something along these lines in 1 Peter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at, is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Peter, Peter here makes a definitive statement. He says that the end of all things is at hand. Very important statement, especially for us today. The end of all things is at hand. The word end is a Greek word that means consummation, fulfillment, a goal achieved. He goes on to say, therefore, or in other words, because of this, or in the light of this reality. And then he goes on to list what our response should be as children of God. Let me paraphrase. Peter is saying, because the return of Jesus Christ is getting very near, and the end of man's rule upon the earth is drawing to a close, in light of how God is wrapping things up in preparation for Jesus' return and the establishing of his kingdom, these are the things we must do in preparation for the Lord's return. And he lists about four of them. I'm only going to look at the first one, because I think it's the most important. He said, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The word serious means to be sober-minded, to exercise good judgment. The word watchful is a word that means vigilant, vigilant. Let me just say this. The church of Jesus Christ today, for the most part, not everyone, thank God, but the church of Jesus Christ has become very unserious in our day. What do I mean? Well, people are more interested in, in, in entertainment in the church, socializing, networking, you know, um, having fun than they are exercising good judgment in using whatever time is left to serve the Lord. Remember, as somebody has said, there's only one life. It'll soon be passed. And only that which is done for Christ will last. Something to think about, right? A serious Christian, excuse me, the same is true with prayer, though. Uh, if a pastor announces 
a concert, we'll say, all right? Um, the church is packed. If he announces a prayer meeting, a few faithful saints trickle in. That's where we are. When I say the church is more concerned about having fun and entertainment, you can always tell um, how strong a church is by its prayer meetings. That, that, that's a given. But also, guys, being watchful in prayer implies that a Christian knows the prophecies concerning Jesus' return and is praying accordingly. And based on those prophecies is watching for Jesus' return. Listen, not just waiting for His return. There's a big difference between watching for somebody's coming and waiting for somebody's coming. I might invite you over for dinner. And we talked about 6 o'clock. But I get busy doing some last-minute details, right? I get busy. I'm not really standing by the door watching or by the window. And you come and catch me off guard. That's different from if I was standing by the window watching for your coming. Because if I'm watching for your coming, you're not going to take me by surprise when you get there. The same is true with Jesus, right? We have to be looking for the Lord's return. We have to be watch, watching, not just waiting for His return. And guys, being vigilant and watching for Jesus' return wouldn't be possible unless God, through the Holy Spirit, hadn't given us signs to be watching for, right? How are you going to be vigilant and watching for the Lord's return if you don't have any signs that indicate when these things begin to happen, His coming is very near? In other words, we couldn't watch for the Lord's return if God hadn't told us in His Word what was coming in the future. Events to be on the lookout for that would indicate, again, the Lord's return is getting very near. A big one was the rebirth of the nation of Israel. That was huge. I was telling First Service for many centuries, theologians and, uh, and, and scholars all believe that all the prophecies about Israel being reborn as a nation, that was all allegory. Had to be. You, you, no nation has ever been out of its land for hundreds of years only to be regathered and become a nation again. Never had happened. So they all taught it was, it was, uh, it, you know, it was uh, uh, allegory, metaphorical. Until May 14, 1948 came. And the modern state of Israel was reborn. Then all these guys are grabbing their Bibles and looking and saying, what else did we spiritualize? That was, that was literal. I mean, I, I get it. There are things in the Bible that are allegorical, Right? When Jesus said, I'm the door, he wasn't saying he's made out of wood or take refuge under the shadow of God's wings. He's not a big bird. We get that. There are allegories. But I believe to read your Bible as literally as you possibly can, you'll be on safer ground than if you spiritualize all big chunks of it, as some people do. But that's what makes prophecy so important to us as Christians. We couldn't be vigilant without it. Now listen. As I bring this to a close, as Christians, the return of Jesus Christ that we are looking for, that we are looking for, is, is Jesus' return for his church when he snatches us off the earth in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're caught up to meet him in the clouds, and he takes us to heaven for seven years while the tribulation is going on down on the earth here. We call this return the rapture, of course. But the problem with watching for the rapture is that it's imminent. In other words, it could happen at any moment. God hasn't given us anything, anything to look for for the, for the rapture. It's imminent, right? In fact, Jesus said in Luke 12, 40, Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So how can we be vigilant in looking for Jesus coming for his church at the rapture if it's imminent? Which means, again, there are no signs to be for us to be uh, on the lookout for indicating the rapture is getting very close. How, how can we be vigilant for his coming for us at the rapture? Well, let me just put it this way. Have you been to the stores lately? Have you been to the store? If so, you've noticed Christmas decorations. Christmas decorations are everywhere, right? They're all decked out for Christmas. Now, I know that Thanksgiving comes before Christmas. So if the signs of Christmas are everywhere, it means that Thanksgiving is getting very close indeed. God didn't give us any signs to be looking for that indicate that the rapture is getting close. It's imminent. 
But he did give us 500 prophecies in the Bible to be on the lookout for that indicate that Jesus' second coming is getting very near. And since as Christians we believe the rapture comes before the second coming of Christ, if the signs of Jesus' second coming are everywhere, and folks, they certainly are, we know that the rapture is getting very close indeed. Therefore, the words of Peter become very relevant. 1 Peter 5.8, Therefore stay alert, watch out for your enemy, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Watch and pray, walk in the Spirit. And those are the things that we need to understand. Those are last day's admonitions that we need to take to heart. Because God help us, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And um, I think we have some very, very troubling times ahead of us as a country, and the world does. Um, very thankful for our new president. He's not going to take office for two more months. So evil people can, can destroy the country, country in two months. I came across a proverb some time ago. I don't know who said it. I'll paraphrase. An evil man would rather burn the village down and rule over the ashes than to relinquish power to someone else. And, that, and I don't put anything past some of these people. So pray. Watch for the Lord's return. Pray with all your heart that he sends revival to um, the church, great awakening to our land. And may God help us to be faithful until the end that we would be not just walking but running so that when he comes, we run right into his arms and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servants. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you have put so many prophecies in your word to tell us things that are coming so that they don't catch us unprepared. And we ask you, Lord, to please give us grace to walk with you every day with a renewed hunger for the word, for your fellowship, to spend time in your presence. We just pray, Lord, that you would just bless our um, holiday season. But give us grace, Lord, to be on our knees, though, seeking you, praying for our loved ones who don't know you. We want to see them saved. And we ask you to keep blessing these studies in your word. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.